this morning, good morning. Uh, so you should have seen on the mailing list that project five, let's build the filter in. Um, project five, uh, sorry. Uh, project five was posted, so we'll briefly go over through it today, I'll try to answer any questions you have on it. At a high level, so the basic idea of this project is you are designing the front end of a compiler. <coughs> so you're going to be given an input language. You have to do the lexing, the parsing uh, for this language. And then um, there's already a back end that's written that takes in a certain structure and will execute it. So your goal is to create that data structure. Yeah, to create that data structure. So from parsing the program, you have to create this data structure. So it's incredibly important that you actually go through and understand how this back end works. Right? Because you can't change the back end. So you gotta think about it, you're on a software development team, your job is to do the front end. The back end has already been designed, inspected, and implemented, so you can't change that back end. Uh, which actually is exactly what a compiler has to do normally, right? So the compiler itself isn't executing your code, right? It's generating x86 code that the CPU actually executes. So a similar thing here, right? You're generating some data structure. In the normal GCC compiler's case, that's x86 code. In our case, it's this inter intermediate representation that something else is going to execute. So not only do you have to understand the input language and how the input language works, you have to understand the semantics of this intermediate representation language. Yes. So this project is very similar to projects for parsing, where we have to finish the functions, but you have to write all the functions this time. Yeah, instead of like two. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yay. Yay, indeed. But the language is similar, right? Uh, the language is similar-ish. Okay. So similar but different. Yeah, so, <laughs> so, yeah, you have to the look at the similar. grammar to understand the language. Um, so yeah, this is the basic idea. So you're going to feed into, the, you're creating this blue box here. So you're creating the compiler to generate the data structures. And then this intermediate representation, which is a graph data structure, that's going to be fed into the back end. So um, <coughs> this compiler already exists. You don't have to do this part. All you have to do is that first blue box. Okay. So this is the grammar of the language. You'll have to read through this just like you do all the grammars to figure out how it goes. I won't spend too much time talking about it right now. Uh, it's a simple, I'd say it's a simplified version of the project for grammar. So there's no type declarations. All variables are assumed to be integers and they have the default value zero to start. So this makes some things easier. Uh, tokens are all here. I noticed there was like, it says something about an ID list, but there's no ID list in like the compile. So is that like something we create? Or like, yeah. Is that something in we the create intermediate our, representation? So we'll have like our own ID list we use in our own. You'll have a, you should have a variable list. Yeah. Yes, in your code, some, some type of variables. Exactly, so we'll store that in ours and we'll use that when we're parsing stuff. Yes. Okay. Yeah, so it's not, this is part of the translation process, right? It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. It's not like you're just doing a simple translation, right? You're actually interpreting this input language and then outputting in this intermediate representation what it, it needs to execute. Okay. Also, expressions are not recursive, which makes things easier. Uh, no type declaration section. Uh, we have if statements, which I don't think we had in the other language. Do we have if statements? We did not. We did not. <coughs> That's right. In condition statements, right? Yeah. Um, we have if statements, we have print statements. Um, there's one ID list of global variables, so there's only one declaration of global variables. That also makes things a little bit easier. Um, all variables are integers. And there you go, so that's pretty much it. So, the idea is you need to know what this language does and what the semantics of this language are so that you can properly create the intermediate representation so that the back end will properly execute it in the same way, right? The programmer doesn't know that it's running in this weird compiler or it's running an x86 code. They don't care. They just care that they're writing their program in our language and it should execute the same and have the same semantics. Okay, these things are pretty straightforward. Booleans, right? We kind of all know what uh, uh, Booleans um, or the condition statements. If statements.
statements have valid semantics. Um, you will have, I'm going to tell you now, you're going to have problems with nested if statements. <coughs> they can be recursively nested. So there's actually further on in the document, it talks about how to handle that. So make sure you pay attention to that because it's going to trip you up. Uh, while statements are very similar. So if we look, do you actually have the code over here? Yeah. So, um, uh, let's go dot h file. Uh, so all of these structures in here for compiler.h, these are all the data structures of the intermediate representation. This is what you have to be <coughs> creating. Right, so we have a value node, a go-to statement, an assignment statement, a print statement, if statement, a state general statement node, and that's it. So if you notice, we have So a statement is going to be either an assignment statement, a print statement, an if statement, and a go-to statement. But if we go back to our language, <coughs> let's see, a statement can either be an assignment statement, a print statement, a while statement, an if statement, or a switch statement. So which of these don't we have in our intermediate representation? Which one? A while, sorry. We do have print. We don't have while statement, and we don't have a switch statement. Right? So you have to emulate those semantics in our input language using the data structures given to you in the intermediate representation. Just like there is no x86 while instruction. Right? It, when it writes that code out, it writes code, and actually we'll see exactly how it does it. It does something and then it jumps to the top. Yeah. So no modifications of the compiler.c. Yes, you are not, you cannot change compiler.c or compiler.h. <coughs> No, don't you don't up, just upload your own code up, like I think we did in two. two. Yeah, one of the other projects. I can't remember the numbers. Okay, so for instance, the semantics in our language of a while statement are the normal semantics, right? So evaluate the condition, and then if the condition is true, evaluate the body, right? And if and then go back to step one. So evaluate the condition, then evaluate the body, then evaluate the condition, then evaluate the body. If the condition is false, then you skip the body, right? You go on to the next statement. So we can actually completely write this. We can actually completely emulate these this behavior just using ifs and go tos. So we can say that if we say this is some label, we say if condition, then execute the body, and the last thing there go to the label. Right, so it's going to jump up here, it's going to evaluate the condition. If that condition is true, it's going to execute the body, and then it's going to go to the label again. So this is actually exactly how x86 code is written to do while loops. It's exactly this code. So this is essentially what you're creating using these data structures. And so you're essentially introducing these go-to statements into the generated intermediate representation. Right? Because we have a go-to statement there, but we don't have a go-to statement in our program. So you can't actually write this program in our input language. There is no go-to in our input language. Does that make sense? Yes? But there will be like while. Yes. Is that label actually there in the input? No. It just looks like this. Oh, okay. We're saying this is equivalent to this, right? If we had labels and we had go-tos. You have go-to statements in the input language, so you can or sorry, in the intermediate representation language. So you can represent these. Okay, switch similarly, right? We don't have a switch. What are the semantics of a switch statement? If there's label. If there's yeah, so execute, check that variable, right? If that variable is the first case, then do that case body. If it's the second case, then do that case body. 
the third case do that case body. So it's just a go to. Yeah, so we just have an if. Well, actually, it, yeah, it kind of translates into a bunch of if statements. Uh, but there's an important, yeah. Is it a bunch of ifs or is it if else? What is like, sorry. Yeah, so there's a couple ways to do it. The, e the easy way to do this is to add, transform every case statement into a uh, statement like this and add a go to at the end of there to after all of these. Yeah. And this will help simplify things if you go do it this way. <coughs> Not just because I say, but it's going to make implementation easier uh, when you implement these things. Okay, we can also have switch statements with a default case, which is if it does not match any of those, right? So we can transform this equivalently if the variable is n1, then do statement list one, go to label, all the way up to nk. Otherwise, execute that statement list default, right? Execute that default one, yes. So do we assume that every uh, case has a break at the end? Yes, yes. In our language, every case implicitly has a break. But these statement lists, right? These statement lists can contain if statements, case statements, yeah. Yeah, everything there. And those can contain ifs, statements, whiles. It's going to be the tough part. Yes. Print prints out the value of the variable. Uh, <laughs> got it. OK. So yes, this is, I think, the key to this project, to be successful in this project, you have to understand the intermediate representation, because this is what you're generating, right? At this point, uh, I think you all have got, you know, first follow grammars, generating recursive descent parsers, right? So you can do that code, plus you can follow kind of along with what we did in project four, right? Which is part of what you did, so that part shouldn't be too difficult, but you have to do it and make sure that's rock solid. But this is the key, is making sure you understand these data structures, right? Uh, because, as we can see, so for instance, uh, so statements are basically a linked list of statements, right? Do this statement, then do this next statement, then this next statement. Right? Which makes sense. That's how the compiler is going to, the back end is going to do it sequentially. Right, execute this, then this, then this. The tricky part, but this isn't a linked list, it's a graph, right? So we have, for instance, um, as long as there's stuff there, you can keep branching out. Oh, not the assigned thing, yeah. I wanted the if. Yeah, so the if statement, right, has conditions, and then it has a true branch or a false branch, right? So if you think of it linked list wise, right? link, 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 and then it splits off into two, so there's two possibilities of where it could go to, right? A true branch or a false branch. <coughs> Similarly, uh, a go-to statement can go anywhere. It can point to any statement node. So it can even go back, right? So you can have loops in your graph, which is how you want to do a while loop, right? You want something to continue to happen, and you want a branch that'll branch outside of that loop. Yes? Do we have to worry about else if? What? Else if. Or is it just true or false for all the if statements? Uh, let's see. We don't have to. Wait, say that again? Yeah. Do we have to worry about like an else if? Uh, let's look at the if statement, whatever the if statement says. I think you said. I don't think there's any else said clauses only. to our if statement. Let's see. Okay, yeah, this is one of the things. So we have if condition body. So there is no else in our language. But there is an else branch in the input language. Or sorry, in the intermediate representation. Yes. So there is no else in an if statement in our input language, but the intermediate representation has an else. Right? Which we want to use when we're doing, uh, which we could want to use when we're doing implementing whiles and switches. So another important concept, everything to the, so everything
everything in the, all the variables to the intermediate representation to the back end are represented using this value node structure. So this is going to be some name and the current value of that, the name of that variable. And so, for instance, an assignment statement says, hey, it has some operator, right? So one of the operators is either plus, minus, multiply, or divide. Uh, and then it has operands one and two, which is the left and right operand on the right-hand side. It's either going to add them together minus whatever the operation is. Then it's going to copy that result into left-hand side's value. Right? But the really important thing is these are all pointers. right? You need to make sure these actually point to the same object. Every reference to variable A needs to point to the same value node A. Right? If you have distinct copies, the compiler just looks inside that, this value node to see what the current value is. So that's part of understanding what the back end does and seeing how it deals with assignment statements. OK. Uh, I'm going to kind of let you read through these things. Print statement's pretty easy. You give it an ID here. Um, the statement node structure is a union, so it can be either an assignment statement, a print statement, an if statement, or a go-to statement. And you'll know based on this type, or you will specify which one it is based on this type. Um, let's see. Yeah, we have some code here to kind of help you out. Uh, if and while, okay, this is the key. I mean, I, I think at this point it may be a bit premature to go over all of these in detail because you have to really start implementing this and going through it and reading this section. This is one of the key sections, is how to do if and while statements especially like I mentioned with the recursion. So the key to remember is this is how you have to set up your if statement so that it will work recursively. Yes? Um, as far as uh, the linker, should we modify the one from the previous assignment, or is that given? Good question. Mm, looks like we do provide it for you, so. Great. <coughs> I don't know how I feel about that. <laughs> This I mean, this I mean, all. This is what we did at the start I mean, of the semester. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I wanted to create credit for the third time. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, yes, so this is all about how to handle this. Um, handling a while statement is very similar. Your code, your structure should look like this. You should be able to sit down, look at your code for parsing a while statement, and draw this diagram based on what are happening to the pointers and all the structures that you're creating. Execution is actually incredibly simple if, well, okay, I don't want, <laughs> that makes it sound it's easier easy. than it actually is. Um, <laughs> essentially what it's doing here, so it's starting with the statement node that you give it, right? We know a statement node is a list of a linked list, well, it's a graph, but the start node is a linked list and the next one is going to be the next node to be executed. So it's going to get, put it in the program counter, just like x86 has a program counter. While this program counter is not equal to null, it checks the type of that statement. If that statement is a no-op, it just goes to the next one. Right? So this is how you can if you need to do a no-op statement, which does nothing. For instance, like for a label, a go-to maybe. Uh, a, print, a print statement, it checks the print statement. Uh, it makes sure it does some sanity checking to make sure that there is a print statement and that there is an ID in that print statement. Uh, if it is, it just prints out the value that's inside that print statement. Right, so that print statement is the current print statement. ID is the current, um, is the, uh, the node, what's it called, the value node that's in there. And then you're printing out the value in that value node. And then we're setting the program counter equal to the next instruction. Assignment statement does sanity checking, checks the operator. Uh, if the op is, ah, yes, it does more sanity checking, 
and then it switches based on the operator. If it's a plus, it gets the values out of the two operands of their value nodes, adds them together into result. Uh, otherwise, it subtracts, otherwise it multiplies, otherwise it divides. In the case of zero, when the operator is null, it means you're just doing an A equals B assignment with no operation. Um, and then it sets the left-hand side's value to the result. So this is where you can see this is how values get propagated with the assignment structure. And then it goes to the next program statement. Yeah? Um, for, are you going to, okay, so for the info, are you going to be declaring the variable, like? Yes. Um, in, are you ever going to do it inside the body? No. Oh. The variable declarations are all just one ID list at the top of the program. Um, do I have? Grading test, it's probably not where I want to go. Uh, so like here you declare variables A and B. And so these variables are the only global variables that you have through the entire execution of this program. And then there you have all the statements. You have ifs and additions and assignments. Yeah. So do you advise us to start with, you know, like declarations and then to assignment statements and I would let's hold that so we get to the end. Um, yeah, maybe, I think we're almost there. So that's basically how the back end works. Um, compiler, if statements, right, are exactly what you would think. Um, it evaluates the operand depending on what operator it is, greater than, less than, not equal to. So what are the, so tell me to remember, what are the three operators our back end supports? Greater than, less than, not equal. Right? It's right here. Is that normal? No. Why not? What are you missing? Because you got greater than, less than, or equal to. Less than or equal to. Yeah, so if we look at our, uh, back to the grammar, me scrolling a bunch. Right, an if statement, a condition is a primary, reloc primary, where a reloc is greater than, less than, Okay, yeah, that's fine. Greater than, less than, not equal to. Okay, that's that's good. But, yes, but for an if, for, what am I thinking about? Um, I know this comes up at some point, and I'm going to remember which part it is. Ah, right, when you do, right, when you do a switch statement, What is this saying? Is this saying if variable is equal equal to n1? Yeah. Right? Do you have an equals equals operator? No. Can you add it to compiler.c? No. No, no, absolutely not. That would be too easy. Yes. So you have to think about the data structure you're creating and what's here, right? You can only compare based on not equal, but you have an if branch, right? So Exactly. If you make the false branch a true branch in this case, then you can get around that. Okay. And when you get stuck on these things, you should come back and watch this video because I think it'll be helpful. <laughs> okay. Go to statement. Then we just set our program counter equal to the target of that go to statement. And that is the entire compiler backend here. Yes. Do we also have to implement um, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to? in our while statements, or was it just the equal statement that's done in there? Uh, you have to fully, well, it's like this. You have to fully support the input language. Okay. So you have to look at the input language, see what operators you need in there. Think about default with if and while, those conditions that are in there are the same ones that are in here. Um, but, for instance, if you wanted to extend the language to support greater than or equal to, or um, less than or equal to, or even just regular equals, right? You have to change the way you write out using only these three base operators. You can still do it. to the code that you write, you must implement this method, parse, generate, intermediate representation. 
That's going to return a pointer to a statement node structure. That's going to be the first statement in, your, in this list, right? That gets passed to that execute function we just saw, and everything happens. So you have to implement this in a different file, right? You implement that correctly, and everything's good. So the way you do that is totally up to you. Do it the way we did it, like in project four, of recursive while we're parsing to build up this thing. That's going to be the easiest way that's going to not drive you crazy. So that's kind of synonymous with the program function that we were first talking about. Yes, like parse program yeah. is kind of that. Yeah, but instead of, in that case, we were building up a data structure that represented the parse tree of that program. Mm -hmm. Here, we only care about returning this statement node structure, this graph that represents the program. So it's not just a one to one mapping like it was before. So <clears throat> I'm assuming you would suggest that we implement everything that allows us to parse the entire input language first, and then then go back and then translate it to this intermediate language, just to make sure that we can get through the whole language, being able to parse through it properly, then go through and systematically translate it. Mm, I don't know. I would agree with that. Right. I mean, would you, would you like to offer counter? <laughs> uh, yeah, the counter is you parse what you, so you will have to parse the whole language. Right. Yes. That's what I'm saying. But you need to parse it for a purpose. Right, right. Right. So yes, you, you definitely have to parse the language. But what I would, what I don't think you need to do is to parse it in the sense that you create a whole parse tree from it. Oh, not, I'm not saying that. I'm just yes. saying create the. Yes the setup so that it can be parsed all the way yes. through so without, you do that, without causing exactly. syntax errors. Yes, yeah. that would be very good. Okay. Like that. Yes. Do you know in project four how we were doing like, uh, we were working, well you suggested us do the inline parsing and mm -hmm. you know, store values and stuff like that. Would it be smart to do it that way for this while you're parsing, like to not just, you know, parse everything and then figure out what you're gonna do with the values or the variables and stuff. Um, to in fact just do inline parsing while you're parsing to have other lists and things that you would store the variables and update them. Yes, and until that so that's exactly how I do this part, yes. I would uh, start from here and figure out what parsing functions you need, right? Like for that variable declaration list at the start, right? That is a very well-defined list. You wanna get that list somehow, you need to parse that list into uh, a sequence of IDs and then you need to create essentially a mapping or a list of that ID and a new value node. So that every time you reference that ID, it, later on in the program, you provide a pointer to the same value node. Um, so that's what you have to do first. And then, yeah, that's kind of your global variable, your symbol table, basically. And then when you see any references to those, you properly create the statement. Cool. All right. More questions? Okay, you gotta use C or C++ for this assignment. Uh, CentOS 6.7. Where's Java? Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why is Java? Uh, so, <laughs> Why is Java? Why is Java? So, the other section, so they, uh, okay, so they, the other section decided you can use Java, but you don't get the back end, so you have to do everything. Why? Uh, for me, I would much, I want you to do C and or C++ because that's how we've been going in this course. It's going to save you some work too because you don't have to do the back end. Um, so I'm taking that option off the table for you. Oh, thank you. I mean, Python would be very helpful to you. Okay, um, yeah, submit your own code. Don't submit compiler.h or compiler.c. Uh, Grading. So this is when we get back to the question about what do we do when. So how do I suggest to tackle this? Um, so the points are broken down in different categories. Assignment statements. So programs with only assignment statements. Programs with only if statements. Programs with only while statements. Programs with only switch statements. And finally programs that contain all types of statements. But. Yeah. So I mean. You say that it's a program that only contains if statements, but don't those if statements have to have, you know, something in there, in the body of that if statement? So wouldn't it contain other ah, So that's, so, well, okay, that's true. Um, or would it be just? Yes, this is what we have here. Ah. So, okay, yeah, <laughs> I guess I should have clarified. Yeah, not exactly. So, 
So for us to even test anything, right, we have to see what your program output is. Right. So you need to implement print statements. That would be the very first thing I implement, right? Do print statements. <laughs> Otherwise, we can never test your code. Right? Then, so if, while, and switch all depend on assignment statements. Right? We need to be able to assign things and test if you're going properly in the right branch. So print, do print, do assignment, get those down 100%, and then move on to if, while, switch statements. Cool. OK, questions on that? That was pretty good. OK, I'll just reiterate since we're going over this. Um, bonus project, no. you can either do one of three things. So you can actually you can do one of four things. You can do nothing, <laughs> right? There's totally not good. Yeah. You actually have a lot of choices. I guess you could drop the class or do. <laughs> <laughs> but you have a lot of choices. Um, you can okay. So you can resubmit project three, and this will replace your project three grade, but you have a thirty percent reduction on whatever you submit. So for instance, here, if your project three grade, you got a twenty on project three and you coded up project three to get a 90, right? You'll be reduced, 90 will be reduced by 30% to 63, so your grade on project three will go up from a 20 to a 63. You can also choose to resubmit project four, right? Same thing, you can resubmit project four, penalty of 30%. Questions on those options? Yes. It's not going to go down. Okay. No, I mean, that'd be, that'd be hilarious. That'd be too mean, I think. <laughs> that's like, it's like a, less of a bonus and more of a gamble, I guess. Um, yeah. Uh, your third option, so this option comes with no penalty. So you can replace the lowest grade on either Project 3 or Project 4. But you have to do this entire new bonus project that extends project five and does new interesting things. Oh yeah. <laughs> Can I use it to replace project five? No. <laughs> Just do project five. So <laughs> say if your project five grade is bad enough to be worth replacing, why are you extending? Yeah, you, I would not do that. Right. Um, so here's the grammar for your language. Just to go over this, uh, tokens in this language. So basically, we've extended it such that we have arrays. So you can declare array variables. Um, and we have array accesses uh, in, let's see, variable access. ID, left bracket, expression, right bracket. Um, so we, yeah, we have size, and we specify the size in the variable section after array. So in this one, you actually have to mod compiler.h and compiler.c to support this. So um, yeah, you have to submit everything. Um, and OK, yeah, you can't. in the project 5 section? What? Would this be submitted with project 5? No, there's a bonus on the CSE site. statements in, in the code that you write. Okay. So I mean, except for your debugging stuff, right? You should never write any print statements in the code you oh, submit. Okay. All of the printing, all the interaction, everything is done by the back end. So you already have that set up for us. So as long yes. as we, we know how to do it in the back end so we can make your print Yes, functions. and that's and exactly. Work, then yes. know it's good. Exactly. You should okay. create a super simple example that has one variable and just prints out that variable and it should print out to zero. Okay. Excellent. That's what that program should do. But without any prints in your code, that's the key. Yeah. So, if we attempt, can we attempt multiple ones of those options and simply get the best replacement grade? So obviously you wouldn't allow us to do. We'll take the last one. 
Oh, the last mission. Okay. Yes. So if I say I attempt the third one and I was like, oh crap, this doesn't work, and yes. then I do a great project three and then submit that one less, yes. then yes, it will take back. Questions, comments? Yes. Can I replace uh, a midterm with the bonus project? No, good try. <laughs> yes. When is it due? Uh, the 29th oh. of April. So it's just like the last day. Last day possible. <laughs> that, that's including Project 5 and anything. Yes, everything. Yeah. Everything here. Project 5, all the bonuses, everything. There will be no extension. Yeah. Yeah. No <laughs> extension. That's yeah. right. The next week is yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Could go and find so Why would you want an extension? I feel God. like. It's <laughs> actually bad, but they yeah. force you to like work on it for another day. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I've been in that situation. They do that same thing for conferences. You're like trying to submit a research paper, and you're like working on it, you've been working on it for like two or three days straight, and then like, oh, the deadline's been extended by a day, and you're like, oh my god, I've been working on this, like for sh I just want to be done. Take a nap. Yeah, move on. <laughs> That's so like, take a breath. I understand. Cool. All right. And functions. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've seen, we've been looking at the runtime environment because we're trying to understand what actually happens when we execute our code, right? We want to understand where does the compiler place things, why does it place things there, right? We saw that the compiler places global variables in just a static fixed memory location, right? And we saw that the compiler will put local variables on the stack with an offset of the base pointer. So we'll put it inside the function frame of that function. So now I want to study functions a little bit more. Right? We haven't really <coughs> gone into depth. We've gone into semantics, right, of pointers and assignment statements, right? Did you feel that we went into enough uh, depth and of assignment semantics? Oh yeah, we're good. Yes, we're good here. Cool. So let's do a similar thing with functions, so we can understand everything. Okay. So, what's so special about functions? They can do stuff. They can do stuff. I can do stuff. Am I special? Yeah. <laughs> We're all special snowflakes. We're all special snowflakes, yes. Um, but specifically in code, why are functions special? Yeah. You get to build a subroutine that will do a task that you expect to do more than once. Yeah, so we can kind of declare something, right? And it's in some sense parameterized, and it will execute, maybe change its behavior based on its parameters, but it allows us to kind of specify some repeatable process. It allows, to, it allows you to give things function. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, how do you actually, like, what are the mechanics of a function? How do you actually go about creating one or using one? It's some type of process that takes in some type of input. When you're coding, when you're coding. Oh. Declare. Yeah, you have to first declare a function, and then what? Define it. Define it, and then what? Use it. Use it. Yeah, right? If you just declare or define a function and it's never used, right? <laughs> Does it even exist? Right? So what do we need to declare a function? What are all the things that goes into defining a function? The return type. The return type. The, return type. Name. the name. The parameters. The parameters. The parameters. The parameters types. What else? The, 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 body. the body. The actual yeah. function the actual itself. The stuff that it does. I thought that was the definition. Right? So. There are, oh, we're going to go two separate concepts, right? So we need to define the name. Why do we need to define the name? Think so about the why. It's called, so, so we can use it. Find so it. we can use it later, right? We can find it, right? Just declaring it, we don't really care what the name is. Well, maybe we do if we Under need the to recurse it. doesn't care what the name is. Right. We know, we need to know what it exactly. Then we're going to call, okay, so we're going to separate the, we need to have some terms to talk about the parameters that are in the definition of the function and the parameters that we pass into the function, right? Because those are actually two separate concepts, right? The parameters inside the function and the parameters <coughs> that we pass to the function when we call it. So we're going to call these formal parameters. So I don't know, however, whatever else you think about it, if you think about like a parameter and like a suit and tie, maybe a top hat, you know, formal, okay, cool. And the types. Uh, we also need to know the return type of the function. I guess. Do I have the punch? So now, okay, so we talked about why did, why did we just talk about a difference between declarations and definitions? 
Because you can declare a function without defining it. Why? So that you can use it without having it defined and then define it later. Yeah, right? And that actually helps us in C, or it may not even be our code that defines that function. Mm -hmm. Right? So this kind of gets back to encapsulation. Right? If I want to call some other person's function, right? I maybe I don't want to know how their function is actually written. I just want to know how what that signature looks like, right? I need to know how to invoke that function. <coughs> Yeah, exactly. When you call libraries, all that kind of stuff, right? So we're going to separate declarations from the invocation. So invoking a function, right? We all know the syntax, what it syntactically looks like, right? Here we're invoking a function called what? F. Or passing in parameters f1, f2, all the way to f. Sorry, that's the x. x1, x2, all the way to xk. Bless you. Where x1, x2, and xk are all expressions, right? Do you have to always pass variables into functions? No. No, yeah, no. no you can pass foo x plus 1, right? And it means at runtime, evaluate x, add 1 to it, and pass it in as the first parameter of this function, f. Right? So we're going to call, so this is when we separate. We're going to call x1, x2, xk. These are going to be the actual parameters of the function. So when we invoke a function, we're past, we are setting actual parameters. And the definition, the declaration of that function, we have the formal parameters. So going back to what we knew, right? When we talked about function frame, uh, we talked about the function frame on the stack with the local variables, right? So how do we actually call a function. We go to the, wherever the code is. We go to where the code is. Yeah, we go to the code is. But what happens? Where do these parameters live? Think about now what we've been talking about. Are they global variables? No, they're local. They're local variables to that function, right? So they also need to be inside that function frame, right? Every function needs to be able to access the parameters that it was called with, right? But who puts those parameters there onto the stack? Where do those parameters come from when the function's invoked? Whoever is calling that function. Yeah, the calling function, right? So when we invoke a function, we are responsible for copying those values, the x1, x2, xk, onto the stack so that they can go to that function. So that's actually the job of the calling function. And this actually goes back to why part of the reason why in C you need to know the exact signature of the function, right? Because you need to know when you invoke that function, how much space do I put on the stack and where do I put these variables on the stack <coughs> so that the, that the function can find those, those parameters. So, the function frame, so this, right, we've seen we can move the stack down, we can put values on the stack, right? But what other information when we call a function, what other information do we need? Right? So when you're calling a function, why are you calling a function? To get it to do something for us. It wants to do something for us. So how do we get the result back? Throw it in the return. A return value, usually, right? We need that function to return some value. So where does that return value live? Right? We also need to put all the parameters onto the stack to that function, right? But I think we actually talked about this on Wednesday, right? So we call this new function. The new function completely takes over the CPU, can do whatever it wants. And we saw that actually the very first thing that it does is it changes the base pointer. It sets up its new base pointer based on the stack pointer which completely gets rid of our function's base pointer and our function's, frame, our function's base pointer. So we, where our frame lives on the stack is completely gone. So we need to actually store this, right? We need to, know, we need to save our base pointer so that we know how to get back. So, but, okay, let's think about this, right? Our code's executing, the CPU, the 
program counter or the instruction pointer on x86, right, is executing our function. We call some other function. And what happens when it's done executing? Where do we want it to go? Right back to where we are now. Well, to the next line, not to. Back to the next line after the call. Mm. But how? You save it with your own PC. You update the PC with the function, then the function executes just back to your PC. But how, where do you put your PC? You throw it onto the status tree. Yeah, you need to save it somewhere, right? You have to have it saved somewhere. Because fundamentally, when you call a function, the new program counter is going to be that function, right? And that function is going to start executing. So we need to actually save the return address, is what it's called, right? Or where we want this function to go back and start executing when the invoked function uh, stops. And then we saw we need local variables and temporary variables. So the question is, so essentially, all of these things are going to need to be saved somehow and need to live somewhere when we call a function. But the question is, who does what? And where do these things live? Do I put the return value on the stack? Do I put parameters in registers? Do I put, I don't know, a frame pointer on the stack? Who puts it there, right? Maybe the caller function that gets called, right, the call E, maybe, you know, does it create its space for its local variables? Should a calling function create space for local variables on the stack before a function is called? No. So this is actually just, it, honestly, the specifics don't matter except for the fact that you have to have some kind of convention. Right? Uh, if you're going to call some function that somebody else wrote, right, then your compiler needs to know how to create that call in that code without knowing what that function actually does. So we need some sort of convention so that we can call functions that different people write with different code. So all this information needs to be stored on the stack. So in what order are the things stored on the stack? Or are they put in parameters? And if so, or sorry, in registers. And what if you're trying to pass a parameter that's not 32 bits and so it can't fit in a register, right? What do you do then? Um, so the question is always who can store this and what's the order? So um, we need a precise convention that explicitly says if you want to call a function, you have to do x, y, z in this order. And if you get called as a function, your responsibility is a, b, c. And actually, the crazy thing, well, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how long you've been working with computers. Uh, this actually, this convention completely varies based on processors. So different ARM is different from x86. Uh, operating systems, so Windows calling convention is different than the Linux calling convention. Even, uh, it could be based on the compiler. Different compilers can do this different. And even the type of call. So calling a normal function versus calling a syscall. I know some of you are in the OS class. So calling a syscall, you have to put parameters and registers to call a syscall, where in a normal x86 uh, Linux call, you put the values on the stack. So it completely changes. But these are all specified and defined. So the Linux, the C decal calling convention for Linux, I'm just going to go over this so you know that there is a standard. I won't expect you to memorize this. Uh, but the caller first pushes all arguments onto the stack from right to left order. So the rightmost and then the next to rightmost all the way to the leftmost parameter, the, the actual parameter. Then it's going to push the address of the instruction after the call. So this is that return address. And this is all the caller has to do. And then the function starts to execute. Now the called function, or the call E function, has to save the previous base pointer, the frame pointer, right, from that function that called it. That's its responsibility. Then it has to create space on the stack for local variables. Then it has to ensure, this is actually a key, right? So we're using the stack, right? If you call a function and it changes the stack, you're going to be completely messed up because you're going to try to look for variables based on that stack location, and they're going to be in the wrong place. So it's up to every function to ensure that the stack is consistent when it returns. 
And finally, just to make things even more confusing, the return value is put into the EAX register. So the return value actually doesn't use the stack, which makes it incredibly frustrating. <coughs> cool. OK, so on Monday, we're going to go over a cool, I'm going to preview this a little bit. Uh, we're going to go <laughs> over exactly what this code does when we execute it and how the stack frames look like so that we can understand how function frames live and look like on the stack. <laughs>